Good evening. Welcome to Liberty and Justice for All. Uh, most of you out there know pretty much what I do from watching the show or from hearing about previews and so forth. And basically what I have been involved in for the last, uh, I don't really remember how many years, is different organizations, different people doing all kinds of research around the country. Now from a lot of these organizations, I have been given basically instructions to hate. To hate this group or to hate the government or to dislike this or something's wrong with all the groups. They put all these groups together uh, or they keep them separate but I'm supposed to be a part of one and hate the other. Well, I don't hate anybody. Uh, what I've found is there always seems to be some pieces missing somewhere. Some of the things that go on that the government does, that uh, the media does, the influence in our life, the fear-causing events that keep going on have always puzzled me because they never seem to fit together. There was always something missing. You can talk about one group of conspirators doing this, or you can talk about another group, or you can talk about the Federal Reserve, or you can talk about Congress. I don't care who you talk about. They all seem to be getting their orders from somewhere or their direction. I don't know if orders is the right word. Well, tonight we have Eric Phelps in the studio with us to tell us what he has found out. Now, the one main thing that uh, I have found in all of my studies and the, the only place that people really come out and say, here are a group of people that you're supposed to hate is the Jews. Well, I never hated the Jews. I got some great friends who are Jews. And so I never could figure this out. I don't think the Jews did something bad. I don't think the Jews control the world or even want to. Well, Eric Phelps has helped me out in his study. So now I'm going to introduce you to Eric Phelps, author of The Vatican Assassins. Uh, that's quite a powerful name, name Eric. First of all, welcome to the show. <laughs> and what do you mean, Vatican assassins? I'm going to start right in with, with that. That's an awful powerful okay. two words. Uh, what I mean is that uh, the men who rule the Vatican today, particularly the Jesuit general, are the uh, men who keep order, not only in the Vatican hierarchy, including being over the Pope, but also who maintain order throughout all the governments of the world. Uh, specifically the United States. Well now keep order, they, who do, do they keep order for themselves? For themselves, they right. rule. They rule. The Pope is the absolute uh, master of the world. He controls the Pope. Uh, Peter von Klovenbach is the Jesuit general of today. So he commands his Jesuit order which in turn has all sorts of connections throughout other orders. Now what is, what is Jesuit? What is, what is that? Okay. The Jesuits, uh, actually they're called the Society of Jesus, that is their proper name. They were started in uh, 1540 when they were uh, given legal existence by Paul III, who was the Pope at the time, when Ignatius Loyola created his order. And uh, Ignatius Loyola gave his obedience to the Pope, and it was the beginning of what we would call the Counter-Reformation. It was the antithesis to Luther's Protestant Reformation. Wow. So you have studied this whole chain of events. This is, I mean, you're going to be telling us a lot of history here that I don't Hopefully recall I'll be able to make it. reading in my history classes. No. And I took a lot, of, a lot of history in school. But in talking to you this afternoon and listening to you, they didn't bother to tell me this stuff. Well, no, they don't want us to know true history because if we know true history, we will know who rules today. One of the things that the Jesuits hated about the United States was in the public school system, uh, it taught true history. It taught about the Inquisition, it taught about the Dark Ages, it taught about the Crusades, and it taught about the Counter-Reformation. It taught about the power of the Jesuit order. Um, it was on everybody's lips at the Lincoln assassination in 1865, and right. it was very well known for 20, 30 years after that that the Jesuits had killed Lincoln. Um, but it was hushed up, and by the 30s, with FDR when he came to office, they completely got control of the educational system 
uh, censored true history and ultimately in the 60s removed the Protestant Bible from the public schools. Well, so actually it all fits in. The stock market crash of 29, everybody's desperate. <clears throat> FDR is our savior. Correct. Uh, here I am with a social program to save the world and Correct. So this was, this was a planned thing. Absolutely. The stock market crash was caused by three short sellers, according to Curtis Dahl. And Curtis Dahl was the son-in-law of FDR. And the major short seller of the Great Depression was Knight of Malta, Joe Kennedy. And when I say Knight of Malta, that's the American branch of the Knights of Malta that, is, um, that are the soldiers for the Archbishop of New York, who is considered the who is considered the uh, uh, Archbishop of the capital of the world according to Pope John Paul II. So he rules, he controls the Knights of Malta, the Knights, the first head of the Securities and Exchange Commission was Joe Kennedy, Knight of Malta. Oh really? That's correct and so he caused the Great Depression and Joe Kennedy was the means by which FDR, the 33rd degree Freemason, got into office. And so FDR then introduces his new dirty deal with the approval of the Jesuit Charles Coughlin. Well, I thought Joe Kennedy was busy selling whiskey. Well, he was doing that too. Oh, okay. So he was running the <laughs> stock exchange and selling whiskey. He was, so he, he was doing one good thing. And that wasn't <laughs> running the stock exchange. So, okay. Uh, so, that, so now we've got the Kennedys are tied in basically here. So oh, yes. uh, and you're saying he was basically controlled. I'm saying Joe Kennedy was absolutely controlled by the Archbishop of New York, which at that time was Cardinal Hayes. Later became Cardinal Spellman. Now I remember something. He just struck a nerve when, uh, when I was growing up, and when Kennedy was running, or yeah, when he was nominated to run for president, the big flap was he's a Catholic. And you're speaking of John. 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 Yeah. Well, he's a Catholic, and I never could. It was like, so what? You know, I mean, what does that have to do with freedom and liberty? Is there, a, do you feel there's a connection there? Now, this is an off-the-wall question, I know, but... Oh, sure, sure, because when you read in, in history, the Jesuits always wanted to put a Catholic king on the throne of England. This is why they hated Elizabeth. This is why they sought to assassinate her many times. Mm -hmm. um, their great thrust before the suppression was to get Roman Catholic nobility on the thrones of all the countries of Europe and thereby control Europe. Um, in this country, there was a lot of concern about that, that if Kennedy, as a Catholic, would become president, that he would be beholden to the Pope and carry out his program rather than enforce the Constitution. But it basically had very little to do with religion. I, I, mean, I don't okay. mean... I mean, uh, well, let's put it this way. I was raised in Utah, so... Uh, I was raised in a, re a spe specific religion that was different than Catholicism. Uh, not saying either one's good or bad. I haven't having a clue. Actually, I'm not too crazy about organized religion at all. But the the fact is that it had nothing to do with these two different types of belief systems. It was who could be controlled. Okay, what we have to do is we have to distinguish between the Jesuit order, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, and the Roman Catholic people themselves. Mm -hmm. The Roman Catholic people have no idea of the power of the hierarchy and the Jesuit order. None. Uh, you talk to the average Roman Catholic about the Pope trying to rule this country and you think you're crazy. But that's because he's never been taught the doctrine of temporal power, which the Pope was given in 756 by Pepin the Great. 756. 756. Well, you're getting was, back there away. Right. He was given the temple. He was given spiritual power in 606 by Focus, and he was given uh, temple power by Pepin in 150 years later in 756. And this isn't something that's just read to the average Catholic. No. And when you see the Pope's flag, you see the two keys. One represents temporal power, other spiritual power. Mm -hmm. And when Victor Emmanuel took Rome in 7, 1870, he took the temporal power from the Pope. Pope Pius IX, he said, I quarrel with no man's conscience. Uh, you, Pope, Paul, Pope uh, Pius IX, you can remain Pope of all the Catholics. You can have the spiritual power, but I have temporal power. I am king of Italy. And for that reason, the Pope locked himself in the Vatican and declared himself a prisoner. 
The Pope's great aim is to have universal temporal power over every nation of the world because he is the creature of the Jesuit general. They want all political power. So this, and to me it doesn't make sense because I believe in freedom and liberty for everybody. Uh, so this doesn't compute. When they, when they want this power, obviously they want to control the wealth and the wealth really of the, of the world. Oh, sure. And if you control the people, obviously you control the wealth. Sure. You know, well, in this country, uh, when they controlled FDR, FDR gave all the gold in Fort Knox to uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. Right. Okay. The Jesuits controlled the Federal Reserve Bank and they chartered it through their great agent, J.P. Morgan. Right. Okay. So, but I, I didn't know who was in charge. I knew what happened and it was another, it's another one of those mysteries. Right. We know why this, or we know this exists. We know that it's bad. Who's putting all this together? See, there's too much out there that now is all starting to fit together. Mm -hmm. Now, I feel like things are kind of coming to a head. Mm -hmm. It's like a bubbling pot. It's, it's bubbling, and all this scum is coming up to the top, and trying to scrape it off to find out what is down there is what's tough. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you are provi providing us with some answers. Mm -hmm. So, but it's all fitting together. Right, anyway, back to the Federal Reserve. There was, there's no doubt that that was forced upon the American people. Oh, sure, sure. They forced it two days before Christmas through Congress right. at night. Right. Sure. And then they sold it as something other than it, what it is. Right. Caused the Great Depression. Every bank that was not solvent after the Depression mm -hmm. no longer could do business, and the, most of the banks were controlled by the Federal Reserve at that time. Right. Now mm -hmm. they're. They're basically all controlled by the right. Federal Reserve. And the purpose for the Federal Reserve Bank was to be able to be the exclusive extender of credit to the United States Congress for the building of a huge military industrial complex right. by which they would use the American military to restore the Pope's temporal power around the world, beginning with what I call in my book the Second Thirty Years' War, which began in 1914 and ended in 1945. I show that all the parties worked together. There, was, there were no enemies at the top. Hitler, Stalin, FDR, and Churchill all worked together right. through their intelligence agencies. Right. And you bring all this out in your book. And Correct. You, and you've done this all. Now, what we do on this program uh, mainly is we don't talk about theory. We talk about facts. We talk about what's written, what people have seen and documented. And that's what your book is about. Right. You're not making this stuff up. I have over I have six hundred and fifty quotes in my book. Wow. All indicating that everything you're saying is I have no original ideas. I take from what these men have said over the last three hundred years, these authors, mm -hmm. and put it all together and paint the picture of of what I have in the book. And generally that's that's what's bad for him is when you take all the little pieces and put it together. That's correct, because history is the flow. Right. You have to get in the flow of history, so when you arrive at Dallas on November 22nd, you know what's been before, and so you can know what's going to happen that day. Okay, I know what happened that day. Why do you make reference to that? That was when Kennedy was assassinated. That's correct. That fits in here too? Absolutely. The book, I began my book for the purpose of exposing the Jesuit order with the Archbishop of New York and the, his Knights of Malta and high level Shriner Freemasonry, which also the Jesuit general controls, as are the true assassins of President Kennedy. I show in my book that the Knights of Malta were in critical places at the time of that assassination in the FBI with a man by the name of Cartha Deloach, who still lives who wrote a book called Hoover's FBI, with a man called John McCone, who was the head of the CIA, with another gentleman who was called Henry Luce, who controlled Time Life, who bought the Zapruder film for $150,000 and locked it up for five years right. until Jim Garrison uh, had it subpoenaed for his trial of Night of Malta Clay Shaw. Mm -hmm. I show that uh, Frank Shakespeare was the head of CBS at the time, which is uh, why he had his CFR crony Walter Cronkite uh, do all the reporting. I show that Francis Stankard was the head of Chase Manhattan Bank, who was the one responsible for getting John McCloy on the Warren Commission. Um, all these men were powerful knights of Malta in critical places of power, all subject to Cardinal Spellman. 
And of course, Cardinal Spellman was a good friend of 33rd degree Freemason and apostate Presbyterian J. Edgar Hoover, mm -hmm. and also the 33rd degree Freemason Alan Dulles, who was also formerly the head of the CIA, who was known as the gentleman spy. Now, but now Kennedy wanted to dismantle the CIA, basically. That's right. And he printed. He printed silver certificates. Printed silver certificates. I was in error when I said U.S. United States notes. Yeah, he printed the so that was a, a big no-no. He attacked the Federal Reserve. He attacked the CIA. Remember, the CIA was created after World War II, which Lyndon Johnson called a murder incorporated, which Truman called uh, uh, the nefarious influence of a foreign power, and uh, the CIA was patterned after the SS. And one of the men responsible for setting up the CIA was Hitler's most sinister general, Reinhard Gellin, who also set up and helped to train the Mossad. This, he set up the CIA. That's right. He with Kim Philby, who later became supposedly a uh, defector to Russia, but we know that the KGB and the CIA has worked together since their inception because the NKVD and the OSS worked together during World War II. And we are, we are not... It's so naive to believe that abracadabra overnight with the beginning of the Cold War, these secret intelligence agencies became enemies. Right, exactly. Now you mentioned another one of my favorites in, in there, Arlen Specter. Where does he fit in there? Now here's a real piece of work. <laughs> well, as much as I hate to admit it, Arlen Specter is from the state that I reside in, and uh, he's been a perennial senator ever since that day for the most part. I call him in my book Spelly's Jew. He, was, he worked for the Cardinal. He kept, uh, he was the author, of course, of the single bullet theory. The zigzagging. The bullet, zigzagging, right. ridiculous single bullet theory. Right. And uh, for that, he was rewarded with a lifetime in the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. um, he was, of course, affiliated with the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, he has been a good boy ever since. Of course, he voted to uh, quit Mr. Clinton from being expelled from office. Right. And he's also a, a gun confiscator. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is so amazing, these, these people and these things are out there. And, and what the press does with it, where they s s draw the line, you can't say this, you can't say that, and, and, and everybody goes along with it. Well, and, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm blown away. I mean, this, the, this show that we do, we try and tell truth. Now, before 10 o'clock at night, I can say Arlen Specter, I can say Clinton, I can say U.S. government, but I can't say shit. You know, so you'll have to watch this tape after 10, by the way. I mean, this is absolutely unbelievable when people really find out about these, these people that are out there and what they're doing. If they just open their eyes, they could see it in the first place. Oh, sure. Sure, we have corporate monopolies everywhere. The Knights of Malta control AT&T, IT&T, CBS, PepsiCo. Their corporate structure goes to, str to stratas. We have no idea how deep. Uh, but it's um, the Knights control it. They also use high-level Shriner Freemasonry. They use the Knights of Columbus as well and the Mafia. They all work together. Now, the, the people at the very top of all these organizations, are they aware that they're being used as they're being used? Uh, the high-level Shriner Freemasons, they would know. They, but, okay. But most people. Uh, but most people down below, they don't know. The Knights of Columbus are taught to hate the Freemasons. They're taught that they're enemies. And at a lower level, they probably fight it out a few times. But at the high levels, you have, for example, at the beginning of the Vietnam War, the Secretary of the Navy was Francis Matthews. Francis Matthews was the chief of the Knights of Columbus when he came into office. He was the one responsible for ferrying the North Vietnamese Roman Catholics down to the south, according to Fletcher Prouty, which was the single most agitating thing that caused the Vietnam War. So here's this high, the, the highest knight of Columbus working for Cardinal Spellman, um, causing the Vietnam War. And he's working in conjunction with other high-level Freemasons and Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta being John McCone, the head of the CIA. Prior to that, high-level Freemason of Alan Dulles, head of the CIA. So they're all working together. You just struck another nerve, Vietnam. Uh, been there, done that. Not happy about it. What was that all about? Now, did they, were they there, too? Uh, yeah. 
The purpose of Vietnam, about there? Yeah. The purpose of Vietnam was to kill two to three million heretic Buddhists because the Jesuits have done that before. They, um, they were using Mao Zedong at the same time to kill 50 million Buddhists in China. So to kill the heretic Buddhists off at the same time to, uh, to destroy patriotism in the United States, but they also used Vietnam for the explosion of the drug trade that they had already been involved in a century before with the opium trade out of China. But they exploded the drug trade into the United States using Air America, which was controlled by the CIA, and also the Mafia, particularly Santos Traficante. So the mob and the CIA working together to give us this huge, massive drug trade that's on every corner of every street in every major city. Right, exactly. And not fed by a bad guy in Colombia. No. no and then they use that to justify more laws right. against the average person. Right. So that was... I mean, I went to Vietnam as, as a, in a patriotic way. I mean, I was going to defend my country against the evils of communism. That's right. That's what our forefathers did in World War II. Right. They thought we were going over to fight the Nazis. Right. But we were not told that the night of Malta, Mr. Larkin on, in, on Wall Street was financing Hitler. We were not told that the Federal Reserve was giving millions of dollars to Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was built by Wall Street, and they're going to send American men over there to fight a monster they created? Right. Okay, so what was being done is the Pope was really busy purging Europe of its Jews and purging Germany of its Protestants because East Germany was primarily Protestant. They had built Stalin's Red War Machine with, by, with Henry Ford when Henry Ford built Gorky. And so they mechanized the whole war machine, and those, those uh, trucks and tanks that came in had all made in USA when they killed and mass gang raped the German women of East Prussia and East Germany to the extent that they threw themselves into the wells because they didn't want to be raped anymore yeah. by the savage Red Russian army. All that was built by the American Wall Street and credit. So our, our, my father went over there and became a, a, a tail gunner in Germany for what? They weren't fighting a real enemy. That enemy had been created by Wall Street. Right. My generation went to Vietnam for what? It, the the yeah. North Vietnamese had been created by Wall Street. Right, exactly. So it was to purge heretics pursuant to the Jesuit oath, to make relentless war, to extirpate all heretics and liberals from off the face of the earth, no matter how many Roman Catholic people they have to kill. No matter people, all, all people. Right. Now what's wrong with the Buddhists? What was their big problem with the Buddhists? Well, the Buddhists were not under the control of the Pope. They didn't need uh, him, they could have a sustaining lifestyle there in Vietnam. Furthermore, the Buddhists have been the enemies of the Jesuits for many years. The Jesuits had came into Vietnam or into Japan in the 1500s and 1600s, and sought to take over Japan. Well, the emperor expelled the Jesuits in 1639, and the Jesuits were not allowed to go back to Japan for over 250 years until they were given formal reentry in 1913. So magic year. Right, so it was uh, the, the Buddhists have been the enemies of the Jesuits for a long time, but the Jesuits feign themselves to be Buddhists to get control. But the Buddhists, and I've, I've had a lot of experience in Vietnam and, and other places with Buddhists. Buddhists are about one of the most gentle groups of people. Loving, caring, leave me alone, I'm going to learn for myself. I mean, they're, they're, they're not war people. Right. They're not even. But, but they, but they don't want to be controlled by the Catholic, te the Jesuit temporal power. Right. Because that's why the Buddhists set themselves on fire in Saigon, because of the terrible persecutions of that Jesuit tool, Diem. Mm -hmm. He was persecuting the the Buddhists all throughout Vietnam, and so they were protesting by burning themselves. And of course, Diem was the creature of Cardinal Spellman. Yeah. And Kennedy kicked the CIA out of kicked the CIA representative out of Vietnam, and Diem, of course, ran to the local Jesuit church, which he was turned over to the Buddhist generals, and they executed him. So Spellman was furious about Kennedy's responsibility in the execution of Diem. Oh, really? Right. So now it, it but every time you turn around, apparently in your research, this this all fits together. It's all about the Jesuits restoring the temporal, the temporal power of the Pope around the world by erecting dictators in every country that are loyal to and obedient to the Pope.
of Jesuit making. And when I refer to the Pope of Jesuit making is the infallible quote-unquote Pope of 1870. Prior to 1870, he was not considered to be infallible. Well, I can see, and I have to go in my area a little bit, I can see right now why the Constitution, as written, would be a threat to this control. Why we have this second corporate government in place that basically, uh, under a whole different administration, people still think that they're under the Constitution, but we actually have this corporate government, which is a, is a tool, it's a puppet. It's corporate government, uh, Federal Reserve, bad guys up high. That's basically what we have. And, and if the Constitution were there, and the people were taught under the Constitution, I don't mean to beat it to death, except if it were in place, and people went to school, learned about it, and learned about individual freedom, they would learn to do probably the worst possible thing, and that is, would be to think, and to have common sense, and to, to think for themselves. That would be the enemy of this sure. group, right? I mean, that's... Sure. Sure. The Constitution is a simple document. There's seven sections. Yeah. It was written for anybody with an eighth grade education. It doesn't take a, a master uh, or, or a lawyer or a, or a great Supreme Court justice to give us the meaning of what the Constitution says. Anybody that can read and has common sense can know what the Constitution says, just right. like the Bible. So we don't need these great interpreters. They just interpret to twist and distort to justify their evil actions that they do against us. Right. But the, the, power, the structure of power is the Archbishop of New York controlling the Council on Foreign Relations of New York. Rockefeller Center is right across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral. The Knights of Malta, located in St. Patrick's Cathedral, can go right across the street to Rockefeller Center to Time Life. And uh, then from there, the CFR controls all the bureaucracies of the federal government. Right. So if... if we were to eliminate this bureaucracy or this this shadow government, I don't know what else to call it, it's ridiculous, but if the good guys, so we got a whole bunch of people out there that said, oh, I'm an American, I've learned to think, I'm going to think, got together uh, and reinstated this simple document that we were just talking about, this, it would basically be a war. I would think. That's correct. Um, again, we have to go back to our history of the Jesuits to understand this topic, and that is um, in Europe they had been expelled from every country by the end of the 19th century. The mass firebombing of Germany and the mass firebombing of Japan was payback. Mm -hmm. Germany had expelled the Jesuits in 1872. It would never allow them to return. So the mass firebombing of Germany was payback time for that. Right. Japan had expelled the, Je the Jesuits in 1639. The mass firebombing by the American bombers was payback for that. Um, so whenever you seek to break the Jesuit power in your country, you're going to have an invading military force, mm -hmm. for which I believe they are preparing Red China, Russia, and a huge Muslim host and using Cuba as a staging base in the east and landing on our west coast naval ports in the west. So basically, unless we cooperate, they'll come and annihilate us. That's their threat. But where do we get our liberty? We get our liberty from the Protestant Reformation. When does the modern era begin? The modern era begins in 1648 with the victory of the Thirty Years' War and the Treaty of Westphalia. That's when the Dark Ages ended and modern, the modern era began. That's when inventions begin. That's when art begins to flourish. That's when Rembrandt goes to Amsterdam and paints his beautiful portraits. That's when music starts to flourish with Bach. Uh, we did not have all these wonderful arts in the Dark Ages. Medical schools were closed. The great medical schools of Rome had been shut down. It was illegal to perform an autopsy. You couldn't find how the muscle tissues worked and the central nervous system and the circulatory system. It was illegal to own a crossbow. Nobody had the right to private arms. All that ended with the modern era, with the victory of the Protestant Reformation and the Thirty Years' War. Yeah. And so if we're going to return to that, 
we need to return to the maxims of the Reformation, return to the King James Bible, and we need to never give up our guns because the men who wrote, the man who wrote the Bill of Rights was a Baptist Calvinist by the name of James Madison. Mm -hmm. In the First Amendment, he protects our right to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In the Second Amendment, he protects our right to the sword of just defense, which is the right to bear arms. Right. We need them both. Well, without the second one, we can't have the first one anyway. Right. So uh, absolutely, we need them both. And those are two that I would say are the principal ones that are under attack. The, the guns, of course, being the first, and under all kinds of different veils of crap. I mean, they, they feed so much, I can't say that word before 10 o'clock, but they feed so much stuff to us that is so unbelievable but yet I hear it parroted back from people. I mean, I hear some of this stuff, and I'm thinking, where did you get an education? Where did your thought process go? And, and that's the schools, right? Sure. And uh, the other p the source of the other education is Hollywood. I call Hollywood the Jesuit theater. And I got that term from Boyd Barrett in his book on the power, secret and power of the Jesuits. Hollywood is the Jesuit theater. They're, all their propaganda that they want to change the American culture with begins in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, so there they attack gun rights. The only people that have guns are the police and criminals. The average guy that's a decent individual, he can't have a gun. So the other thing is that in every fascist military dictatorship, because every communist country is a fascist military dictatorship, communism is an economic system. Uh, as far as political governing is concerned, it's fascism. In every fascist communist state, nobody has any guns. Right. You don't have guns. You have terrible persecution, mass oh. death, and so on. So anybody that advocates the ab abolition of gun ownership is really advocating that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's no question. And the people I talk to, and I, I hesitate to use the word intelligent, not ignorant. And ignorant, ignorant doesn't mean you're dumb. It means you don't know. Without knowledge. Yeah. And there are so many ignorant people out there that if they would realize that they're only ignorant, not stupid, and just open their eyes. That's, you know, just like what you're saying right now is... To a lot of people, even some of it to me. I mean, I've gone through a lot of your manuscript. Pretty scary stuff. But it makes sense. And if the people would just absolute, just look at it and say, my God, that is, in, that is a fact. This took place. This happened. They did this, and this was the result. This is what they want now. I mean, you can relate things that you've got in here in the 1600s tomorrow afternoon, I'm sure. sure. I know, certainly, yesterday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So, it's good to have a key. And, and why people would... Now, I know what's going to happen after this show's over. My phone's going to start ringing. You hate the Catholics, or you don't like this, or you don't like that. You're picking on religion. And, I mean, I can hear them all right now. They won't have any justification for this. Well, see, I devote my book to four Roman Catholic priests. I devote my book to Charles Chenequy, who was the one who exposed the Jesuits as the Lincoln Assassins in mm -hmm. 1886 with his great work, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. I devote my book to Jeremiah Crowley, who was an Irish priest who came here and who wrote two great works. The first one is called Romanism, Menace to the Nation, written in 1912. And he also wrote another one called The Pope, Chief of White Slavers which is a tremendous topic. And he warned that the Vatican, or the Jesuits, were going to get control of this government and use this government to restore the temporal power of the Pope. That book gave me the key to understand all the US foreign policy for the last 100 years. The other priest I dedicated to is Emmett McLaughlin. He's an Irish priest. He was a Franciscan. And he wrote some tremendous books. One was Crime and Immorality in the Catholic Church. Another was the People's Padre. In other words, the, um, the investigation, I believe that's the word, into the assassination of President Lincoln. But he wrote several great works. So those four priests I devote this, this book to, and if I was anti-Catholic, I wouldn't be coming to the defense Hardly. of Catholic John Kennedy and his son, John Kennedy Jr., Junior. for his murder. Right. So the issue is not Catholic or Protestant. The issue is right and wrong. Who did what to who? 
Yeah, but I think my point is the media has got people so brainwashed that that's all they hear. Oh my God, he said not good and Catholic in the same sentence. See, see that's why they can't understand the flow of history. Right. They're thinking England Protestant, America Protestant, but it's but it's England and America that the Jesuits captured used those two powerful Protestant nations to attack and destroy the Russian Empire and the German Empire in World War One and World War Two. They used it to attack and destroy their enemies of Germans, Germany and Russia. So we got to forget these labels of Catholic and Protestant, and we got exactly. to find out where the Jesuits are in every nation and see what they're doing there. Right, and who yeah, exactly? And this hierarchy of control. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but I, after reading what you have in here, this is a history book that should be required reading for everybody before they can get out of high school. I don't care if they can add two and two. They have to know what this history is. What they do with it is what they do, just like we tell everybody on the show all the time. We don't care what you do with this information. It's up to you. You're the one that either has morals or don't, or you don't. So if, you ha if you're armed with the history, if you're armed with the knowledge, then you can determine what's right and wrong and what, how you're going to react. But I, I don't know, how can we go about getting this in all the third grade primer? I think this would be perfect. It's, you know, there's always been good men of every age and uh, always men who wanted to do what was right of every century. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have to be up to them. There is no savior. There is no hero, humanly speaking. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ is our savior if we believe on him by faith, according to Romans 1.17. But as far as men that live now, there's no one that can come and deliver us from this. It's going to take individual good men and women that will speak the truth in love and then uh, do what they can in the power of the Spirit to resist these men because at the top, they're Luciferians. They worship Lucifer, and so there's a lot of occult power in what they do. Mm -hmm. So it's not just physical. And when good men and women begin to do what, they're, what they should do, then things will change. Automatically. It isn't, it isn't like a war. You don't have to line up and start shooting. Well, beginning it's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual warfare that we have to deal with. But unfortunately, it, it always becomes physical. They always bring in an invading army. That's their only answer. I mean, sure, that's their answer, and they're, they're prepping them now for that. For example, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in, in uh, Yugoslavia. I mean, that was not a mistake. They're firing up the red Chinese to want to invade us. Yeah. And they're going to do the same thing with the Russians. They're firing up the Arabs to invade us now. They've already entered into a pact to destroy the great Satan. So when we see all these foreign soldiers coming and mercilessly doing what a foreign soldier does, hopefully we will have been prepared for that. Right. And spiritually is our, is our main preparation. Spiritually is our main preparation because, for example, the American Revolutionary War, before those men won that war, there was a great revival called the Great Awakening of 1735 mm -hmm. with the preaching of Jonathan Edwards and sinners in the hands of an angry God. Yeah. Men needed to repent. And when that happened, then they had the guts and the fortitude to, to, to trudge it out at Valley Forge. To fight. To fight. To fight, yeah. Now, I don't remember a lot of that in the history books either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who writes history books? To the victor goes the spoils. Whoever is in control writes history. Right. So if you have men with an agenda for world government and the Pope ruling your country, they're going to write the history. Like mm -hmm. Macmillan, like Scrivener, like um, all these various publishing houses out of New York, they wouldn't touch my book. Be because the archbishop controls all those publishers. Mm -hmm. So so they're going to control the press just like what they said they would do in the fourth session of the Council of Trent. Because remember, the fourth session of the Council of Trent condemns freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of conscience. Right. And uh, so that's in direct antithesis to our Bill of Rights. And that's one reason why they destroyed the state of Virginia in the Civil War. Because Virginia produced the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, and the Monroe Doctrine. Right. Yeah. All, all very detrimental to their efforts. Totally contrary to the Council of Trent. Right. So we're possibly in a situation of being punished again for thinking for ourselves, if in fact that's 
enough people will actually do that. Uh, and, and I see the reaction a lot. When I talk to people about something logical or something factual, uh, and I can't think of a for instance, but you get in front of a group, and I've had this happen a number of times, that, that maybe our adversary. You don't know for sure, but you get in front of a group uh, that you don't know exactly how you think. And you bring up an issue or a situation backed up by facts and logic, and their only response is an explosion. That's the only thing they do. It's a total emotional explosion back at you, uh, telling you that to take your basically your your facts and your common sense and stuff it. This is this would be the war. I mean, this would be their that, why that why that would be their only retaliation would would be physical violence. That's the only way they could get to us. Um, is that wrong or? Well, that's, I'm sure that's uh, on some of their agendas. Yeah. But um, I think one of the keys is to not be obnoxious, to try to present your material in a way that brings uh, credibility to yourself, that you're conducting yourself as a gentleman, that you're not making outlandish accusations, that you're not condemning any one group in particular, like the Catholics, mm -hmm. which I've been accused of, but that you're going after a specific body of men who are all under oath, who owe absolute obedience to their superior, who will believe that black is white and white is black if they're told to believe such. Um, when we go after the Jesuit order, the secret society, what we do is to seek to expose their doctrines, like their theologians, Emmanuel, uh, Man, uh, Emmanuel Sa, Licori, Bausenbaum, um, Molina, Alagona, you expose all the Jesuit theologians where they justify the murder of kings, tyrants, usurpers, and in their definition, a usurper is someone who does not submit to the temporal power of the Pope. So uh, you expose all their doctrines, you expose their secret instructions, you expose all their basic tenets, and then you, you relate those basic tenets to the history of what's happened in the last two, three hundred years. So we're attacking what, what we what we attack what they believe and what they do we do not hate the Jesuit order we hate their deeds and their doctrines right. well I didn't find any hate in your book at all well, thank you I, I didn't <laughs> I went through it all and I found absolutely no hate I found a whole bunch of questionable actions by a lot of questionable people or a basically moral morally defunct people but I didn't find any hate all you all you have done is say is come out and say this person did this and caused this to happen that's all you said yeah. and, you, and it's very well documented yeah. and, and we also have to realize that we've been victims we've all been victimized to a certain degree more or less mm -hmm. we've all been robbed through the income tax we've all been used to fight the the Jesuits foreign wars uh, you know, several of my dear friends were killed in Vietnam. I had a swim teacher that I loved very much who was killed there. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've been victimized by them. And so what we need to do is tell the truth as to who really did this. Now, the Kennedy family, they've been victimized. Is there any, you know, reason why Teddy Kennedy shouldn't be a drunk? He knows who killed his brothers. But do you think he could ever say a word about it? Oh, no. Never. Not and so, live. Not and live. Right. Just like uh, John Jr. He wanted to say something about it, and his his airplane goes down. Right. He was. So, uh, I understand. The rumor has it that he was prepared to say something about it. I'm ready to sneeze. That's he, okay. Bless you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. He was ready to say something about yeah, it. Yeah. That's what was what was being said that he was going to come out and start basically talking mm -hmm. and. And, and so, uh, and, now, and then all of a sudden, another tragedy. Yeah. So these men in power that maintain power, they can't say anything, because they're under oaths. If anything's going to be said, it has to be by us who are not under their oaths, who are not associated with them in a formal way. We've done our homework. We don't, we don't have access to any secret CIA documents. We got all this from books in circulation for the last two, three hundred years. But before we can do anything, we have to have the knowledge. Right. We have to be armed with the knowledge. We have to be ready to accept it. Many people aren't ready to accept it because, well, other 
the truth will set you free, but they don't want to be free. I guess. I assume. I don't know. I, it's a phenomenon I don't understand. Well, the American population is a is a great, very powerful population when it wants to be. There is no country that we could not defeat. We have the technology and we have the will to do it. The Chinese, they don't have the will. They're slaves. The Russians, they don't have the will. And during World War II, if if the Hitler's invading army would have been half civil to the Russian people, they would have joined him to overthrow Stalin. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any will to, ex to win a war. We do. We could beat anybody that we wanted to. But what we have is high-level treason. We have, well, they're selling us out. So, so there's no one that can beat us if we want to. The problem is we are, we are controlled by Hollywood, by the, by the moguls there. Mm -hmm. We are controlled by the American Medical Association, by all the drugs and vaccinations and immunizations that they've given us. Right. And we're controlled by the consumption of drugs and, uh, and the abuse of alcohol. So you get a, a people addicted to games and amusements. Uh, they're more concerned with the batting average of a baseball player rather than who runs their government. Mm -hmm. So you get them concerned with that and the, the road rage and uh, get them addicted to a violent and sexually promiscuous movies. And that's what your culture becomes. Right. The art form dictates the culture. Right. And so they've got it. And so if, until we can break our minds away from that kind of control, we really can't perceive their power. Well, more and more people, I mean, the good news is more and more people are mm -hmm. seeing through this. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, your uh, Monday night beer drinking belcher is becoming more extinct it is because it is, they're happening. I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. They are saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And I think probably too many commercials hasn't totally fried their brain as they're supposed to. They're saying, wait a minute, I'm not that stupid. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, there is a trend. There is good news here. There's well, I hope the gun issue wakes people up because I think the average guy realizes that if you don't have a gun, you can't defend yourself. Right. And you need to defend yourself. It's not the police responsibility to defend you, according to the Supreme Court. It's not the, really the Army's responsibility to defend you if you're going to be invaded. It's your responsibility to defend yourself. Right. And so hopefully that issue will wake up enough people. Well, if they would wake up, uh, yeah, wake up is the right word. I mean, the whole reason to have a gun is so you won't need it. Right. That's the right. bottom line. I mean, the whole reason to have a military is so you don't need it. That's right. Washington said in order to, be pre in order to prevent war, you must be prepared for it. Exactly. I mean, if I, if I act like a sissy walking down through a tough side of town, I'm going to get beat up. Right. But if I walk down through, the t through that town and I look them square in the eye and they know they're going to deal with a man, they're not going to bother me. Right. And it's the same way when you deal with nations. Nations will abuse you and misuse you and take advantage of you as soon as they can see that they can do it unless you let them know that we're not going to tolerate this kind of behavior. Right. And then they're your best friend. Right. Absolutely, sure. yeah. They, they'll do anything to be your friend mm -hmm. and stay your friend. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to get this out there? Well, I'm uh, trusting the Lord that I will be able to find a publisher to publish it. And then uh, hopefully it will be uh, distributed and people will want to get it. Well, I hope so too. I would, I would like to get it in the hands of every, every preacher that he could preach it from the pulpit because that's where it needs to begin. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, Christian schools where they could begin to teach that to the children. Right. Because my generation and my father's generation was pretty well brainwashed and what we need is a younger generation that knows the truth from about the time they're 18. And that would make a great difference. Right. Well, that means we've got to put it together in the schools now. And, or at and, home, too. And at home. Because fathers don't spend time with their children anymore. Well, the system also is set up to where the, the father and the mother, when there are two parents in the home, uh, have to work full time just, just to pay taxes right. and survive. Yeah. and raise their two and a half kids. I mean, it doesn't, to me, the system designed isn't just because the government and everybody else needs more taxes. It's to make sure you don't have the time That's right. to understand what's going on. That's exactly right. No time to think. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So thinking, I, I believe, is the key. Mm -hmm. And if people would learn to do it, TV takes it away. Everything's 
sports, and I'm not against sports. I like a good football game as good as well as the next guy. But being consumed by it is ridiculous. And the movies that are out, I, I have trouble even going to a movie anymore or watching a movie because and probably I go too far, but I'm picking out little things in the movie saying, well, what do they really mean by this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and mm -hmm. instead of enjoying the movie, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always looking for some underlying thing. And that's because of this, because I know that this exists. Mm -hmm. I know that the control. Now, the, the Jesu Jesuits basically, aren't they pretty much the Illuminati or, or, or close to it? Sure. The, uh, the Jesuit order was suppressed by the Pope in 1773 with a papal bull, which is the strongest language that a Pope can speak in. When they were suppressed, that means that they could not have any legal existence in any Roman Catholic country. That means they could not legally exist in Poland. They couldn't exist in Austria. They couldn't exist in Spain, Portugal, France. They could have no legal existence there. So what they did was they went underground and they started, among other secret societies, the Illuminati with one of their soldiers, Adam Weishaupt, and you have now the alliance between the Jesuit general and the House of Rothschild. But what we're never told is where did the French Revolution come from? That French Revolution was payback for the suppression of the Jesuit order. France was decimated. Thousands of Dominican priests were killed by the Jacobins. The Jacobins were controlled by the Jesuits. The ultimate was the raising of Napoleon Bonaparte from the Jesuit island of Corsica. And he was a Roman Catholic Freemason. So he was used to punish the Knights of Malta who had expelled the Jesuits from Malta. He was used to punish the Pope because he imprisoned him for five years. He was used to punish the Braganzas, the, the monarchs of Portugal, by driving them into exile into South America. He was used to punish the Bourbons of Spain because the Bourbons had expelled them out of all their Spanish possessions in South America. And he was used to punish the Bourbons of France with the beheading of Louis XVI and the beheading of his Habsburg Austrian queen, Marie Antoinette. So it was punishment of Austria for expelling them from, from Austria and punishment from France for expelling them from there. So after the Napoleonic Wars, after Napoleon punished Europe, he deliberately sacrifices his army of over 600,000 men in Russia, in the snows of Russia, gallops away on a, on a, on a um, what do you call it, a sleigh, and leaves his army there. Yeah. So, and he deliberately betrayed his army, just like Hitler deliberately betrayed his German army in the east during Operation Barbarossa. Mm -hmm. So, that's what happened during the Napoleonic Wars. That was the purpose for Napoleon Bonaparte. And to compare the French Revolution with the American Revolution is a travesty. It should never be done. Okay. Why? Just because of how? Be, well, because that the Jesuit order, the Jesuit was in control of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. They were not in control of the American Revolution. Right. The American Revolution was Protestant. It was carried on by Calvinists. Washington was a Calvinist. He was baptized into a Baptist church of New York by one of his captains, Captain Gano. And so Washington, and he never went into a Masonic Lodge. According to his own words, he was never the master mason of any Masonic Lodge, and he only went into a lodge during the last 30 years of his life about one or two times. Those are his own words in a private letter, which I have in my book. Mm -hmm. So it was a Protestant, Calvinistic resistance to tyranny by the Jesuit King of England, King George III, whereas the French Revolution was payback. It was vengeance. But do you think that, uh, I mean, I've studied the revolution, and you're right, it was a totally different thing. But I feel like we're starting to be, we're being punished now for that, for, for that revolution. For the American Revolution? Yeah. I mean, we, they are trying to take back what the American Revolution supposedly established. Well, <clears throat> you mean practically? Practically. Okay, because they took it back in 1868 well, with the 14th Amendment, and then... Yeah, the 14th, uh, I know, but I mean, this, we, we ended up with a constitution, or, or a uh, constitutional republic from the Revolutionary War. Correct. Supposedly. Cor okay, absolutely. And, and, and it didn't last that long. It only lasted until 1868. 1868, when, with the 14th Amendment. And that created the Holy Roman American Empire. Right. From 1868 to the present, by which they used it to restore the temple power of the Pope. Right.
after they destroyed the Protestant South and so on. But they basically, uh, I mean, they lied to us. Oh, sure. I mean, it's still in the school books. I still sure. read the 14th Amendment was put in to free the slaves. I mean, it, it, you it's know. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. it, if people, again, would study it and learn what it says and what it means and then know who they are and remember how to think or just think. I mean, just... When you see something going on that doesn't make sense, think about it. That's all. Well, when you have professionals that don't want to think, it's very hard to have ask the common guy to think, even though they're probably more capable. For example, we have an epidemic of cancer, and yet nobody wants to deal with the causes for that. Right. We have an epidemic of heart disease. Um, they don't want to deal with that. So. It, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but if we want to be free, freedom carries with it the responsibility of being able to think for yourself and, and doing what you need to do. Well, you brought up an interesting uh, term this afternoon. I never heard it put quite this way, layman. We have been taught that professionals have to make the laws and the rules and do everything because we are laymen. And you said, and I never heard it put this way, Layman is a term that applies to everything. Uh, in, legal, medical, government, see, those uh, in charge know, and the rest of us are laymen, so we don't know. That's, see, that's what they call us. That's what see, they call there, us. There's no such thing as a layman. That's a ridiculous term. Right. Um, but when you have organized religion, you have a priesthood, and everybody else is the laity. When you have an organized medical profession that's victimizing millions of people every day, mm -hmm. you have the medical priests and anybody that, who studies medicine is a layman. Right. They can't know as much as a doctor, right? right? It's the same way in the law. You have your lawyers and, and judges. They know it all. But those of us who are not that, we can't possibly know anything about the law, can we? Because we're just laymen. Right. Now, to be called a layman is to be insulted. Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't matter. But I... I wanted to make a point to people out there that we're not laymen at all. Not at all. We know too much, and that makes us basically, instead of laymen, and we, they might as well label us the enemy. They already have. Well, that's true. They and already the Jesuit have. oath, they already call, have called us liberals and heretics and called for the extirpation of all of us from off the face of the earth. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're running out of time. I told you only had an hour. So we can, I don't think we uh, really got through chapter one. But Eric, your work is absolutely amazing. I know that the phone's going to be ringing. I know they're going to be calling me names, but I'm very used to that. But I also know I'm going to have a lot of calls from people that say, I want to find out more about that. I want to know how to help. And to find out how to help is to find out how to think, to read, to see what's going on, to really know what, what we can do with anything. So. Uh